Good evening. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the Saltzman series for visiting writers. My name is Hannah Dow, um, and I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of English and Philosophy. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce our visiting writer, the poet and scholar, Kimberly Kiyoge Andrews. She is the author of A Brief History of Fruit, winner of the Akron Prize for Poetry from the University of Akron Press, and Between, the winner of the New Women's Voices Chapbook Prize from Finishing Line Press. She lives in Maryland and teaches at Washington College. Reading Andrew's most recent collection of poems, A Brief History of Fruit, is a delight in an intellectual and physical sense, as I expect you will soon see if you haven't already had the treat of, of seeing. While reading this collection, I found that holding these words in my mouth felt much more like the experience of eating a fruit, like an apple or a clementine, a peach, an apricot, a mango, or any one of the many that appear in these poems. The words are sonically delicious, juicy even. They force your mouth to contort into surprising and occasionally unfamiliar shapes as you encounter lines like those in one of my favorite poems in the collection, The Minnow where a girl watches her grandmother prepare squid. Quote, the aproned comma of my Lola cleaning squid, deftly her hands moved between the knife and tentacle, cradled the clouded mantles, end quote. But where there is pleasure, there is also pain as the young girl encounters the reality and grotesqueness of death, perhaps for the first time. Quote, the smell of the sea, the presence of death, the preserv preservative of salt laying its net upon my face. And the particular experience recounted in this poem, both pleasurable because nostalgic and painful because harrowing, recalls Diane Seuss's introduction to A Brief History of Fruit. Seuss writes, there is no eating fruit without decimating its wholeness. And it is this split especially in regard to the speaker's bifurcated racial and cultural identity that generates the book's intricate architecture and vitality. And so from that, I take this to mean that in Andrew's poems, it is easy to see that there can be no pleasure without someone's pain, the speaker's own, a squid's, or even an entire country's. As the speaker recollects and meditates on the many histories that have touched her life, these poems tear through all the sweetness of what it means to be human, nourishing the reader's mind while simultaneously reminding us that, like a fruit torn open, the act of living is an irreversible experience. And when she visited my poetry students today, uh, Andrew said, we can't recognize beauty or love without loss. And I think that this captures very accurately the experience of reading or hearing these poems. It is an experience of delight, but it is the kind of delight that is underscored by the recognition that pleasure cannot exist without labor, pain, or grief. However, what is truly an uncomplicated delight is the privilege of introducing such a fantastic writer and thinker as Kimberly Kiyoge Andrews. So please join me in welcoming her now. Thank you so much. Um, can everybody hear me? Am I hearable? Is that good? Okay, good. I'm seeing, I'm seeing raised thumbs. That's excellent. Um, I'm assuming that my face and shoulders are projected in sort of an alarmingly large format on a screen somewhere. So <laughs> good. Um, this is as close to Big Brother as I'll ever come to being. So that's very exciting. And I'm really glad that Missouri Southern has provided me with the opportunity to be like quite literally very much larger than life. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks for those of you that showed up in person. Um, I know that that's, you know, that's weird nowadays, but it's great to see some faces in the audience. Thank you to those of you I can see in attendees list um, on the webinar screen. Those Thanks very much to those of you that have attended virtually. Um, it's really exciting to be able to give readings in this sort of bizarre, it's, it's weird and we're tired of it, but it's also very cool to know that there are participants that like might not be anywhere near Missouri. And then there are, you know, participants such as you who are on campus. Um, so I'm going to read for probably about a half an hour or so um, from this book, which is A Brief History of Fruit. Some of you have it. I, I believe there are copies of it somewhere. Um, so if you don't already have a copy, you can get one and I will even have signed it for you. Um, so I hope you do do that. 
Um, I'm going to read from this book, and then I might actually read one or two poems, depending on time, um, from my earlier book, the chat book that Professor Dow mentioned called Between. It looks like this. It's from Finishing Line Press. Um, so if you like those poems, that's available too. Um, not in person, but you can always get it online. Um, but I'll start. I'll start with the most recent with the most recent book. Um, and I don't know how much anybody knows. I mean, I gave Professor Dow's class a big long spiel about how this book came into being um, in the advanced poetry workshop earlier today. So I won't rehearse that whole thing in case there are other there are students. I know there are some students um, in the audience, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that again. But what I will say is that the book does sort of move between the United States and the Philippines, um, but it spends more time than you might think sort of inhabiting a space that is neither here nor there, right? The poems might be placed, but a lot of the sort of cogitating in the poems really does think about um, what it is like to be in neither place. So I think I will start with a poem that's actually towards the end of the book that is one of these really sort of bird's eye poems, really gives you a sense of the, the whole collection. Um, and it's just a meditation on what it is like to be between races um, and to feel like you are both alone um, in your sort of experience because like you can't share exactly, you can't, you know, exactly identify with like either of your parents, which is kind of strange. Um, but that you also belong to like a growing community of people because if we know anything about the United States, it's that everybody calls us a melting pot all the time, right? And so you know that you're not alone even though you might feel like you are. Um, so this poem is called What We Have. We have too many bags to make it into the house in one trip. We have a roof that gets partial sun and so is both bare shingle and covered in snow. Although I guess that's probably true for most folks. Because what is multiplicity, if not merely the fact of our being in the world, that is, if not merely two forearms touching on a bright beach towel, the commonality of towels. So then the question becomes one of the distinctions between modes of multiplicity, of one's relationship to negation. Perhaps it is the homesickness, intractable as an aspen stand, objectless as pebbles. We are to be found at all temperatures, in the updraft and the downdraft. We have the nowhere everywhere eyes. We say we are always on the lookout, and this is true, and a fib simultaneously. We have Craigslist ads and grammatical concerns about conjunctions. Some of us are asked by cashiers and some of us lie down in the field, both flooded and aerated. And what saith you unto us besides, I thought so. We are all good enough Kantians to recognize the minor sublime to know that danger is often intrinsic to the fact of the body, that God has a body. We have metaphors that all seem to be about math. We know that all is German for the vacuum of space. We leave blank most questionnaires for what is choice, if not the origin of misprision. And what is an ocean, if not the dissolution behind the copula? So as I was reading that, I was thinking about um, the sort of the line that da danger is often intrinsic to the, to the fact of the body um, alludes in a way to racial marking um, as we keep finding out over and over and over again, those sorts of racial markers are the things um, that either make you safe or put you in danger regularly. And so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to read two poems that are, uh, they're not related, they're actually not even really near one another in the book, um, but they both relate to sort of my relationship with my, my mother who is a sort of like 
very person of color and I, whereas I am, I do not mark in that way. And so um, grappling with that fact is a recurring theme throughout the book. So I'm gonna read two poems um, in a row that both deal with that in different, in different ways. Um, the first is an ode to my middle name, um, which Professor Dow pronounced perfectly. <laughs> and so kudos. Um, and it is called Ode to the Letter Q, which is also, it's not exactly the same title, but there's a title basically called like Ode to Q or something by Sharon Olds, which appeared in the New Yorker a while ago, and which was about the Iraq war. And I'd already written this poem. And so I had to add a little epigraph onto it. Uh, so this is called Ode to the Letter Q. And the epigraph is not after Sharon Olds. It's a perfectly fine poem, the Sharon Olds poem, but it, I, it has nothing to do with this one. A quail bobbing in its variegated affirmative or trembling, the contraction of air and space like something plummeting. What strangeness allows, what I see, what, what in the plumage of a kickstand, unfathomable as closets perched, propped on top of a slanted shelf. Oh, with ornament, I wear upon my head to signal the deep brown of my eyes and hair as rooted as reckoning. Hello, squinting. Hello, what kind of name is that? Though not unkindly, a registration, a record, round magnification of my value, lovely derivative, the shape of a palette of paint, surface blended to a uniform beige, a hollow with a handle, a scoop with which to fish my mother out from the deep pool of my embodied whiteness. This is not a poem about printing the dead, but rather an attempt to show you the two small beasts that I keep in my hands. And then the second poem that is sort of in this vein that I'll read um, is, it's called Notes on the Spine Part Two. The page prior to it has Notes on the Spine, on the spine Part One, and it um, deals with the fact that I have, I have scoliosis. So one of my shoulders is like constantly lower than the other. And it causes me any number of troubles um, but my mother uh, is a radiologist and so I'm constantly complaining to her about her joints and she constantly just like doesn't really care. So this uh, Notes on the Spine Part 2 is kind of about that. Notes on the Spine Part 2. We hinge like puppets until we don't. I call my mother to tell her about a new pain in my knee and she tells me I'm just getting old. That's just the way things are now. She's probably right, but I hear my dad in the background saying, Thelma, don't be a bad mom. I probe my patella on its bed of tendons, my achy hips in their sockets. You're not a bad mom, I say, just a mean one. We laugh. The joke is that Asian mothers are blunt like ball peen hammers, precise in their denting, that my frame is now wonky from the repeated blows. Of course, this metaphor makes no sense. Of course, she loves her daughters better than her mother loved her. But that's a joke now, too. Bimbi, you got fat. I, on the other hand, have always been told that I would learn to love the legs I thought were too gangly and pale, that I, in some important sense, would form a lovely shape. No risk of me getting called a chink on the soccer field. My mother does not understand my anxieties. This is fair in some ways. After all, I have been given everything this country asks for. I'm sorry your joints hurt, my mother says. You grew too fast. All right, so. I'm thinking about these things recently um, because I am thinking about police violence, racial violence, who gets subjected to these things and who is spared from them. Um, so I'm just gonna continue in that vein actually, but now we're gonna move across the Pacific uh, to Manila and um, where I spent in a, like a summer a while ago, when I was when I was first drafting this book, actually, I spent a whole summer there. 
um, in this sort of like program for Filipino American youth to sort of like think about sort of restorative justice and politics in the Philippines, uh, which turned out to be like a real, <laughs> a real trip. But I was, I was living with six, eight other Filipino American women um, in Manila in the sort of like apartment. And we would sort of travel around and learn about various sort of like political activists um, in different parts of the country, which is incredibly formative for me. And it informs basically all of the, even though I've, I've been back several times since to visit family, um, that first extended trip, which happened when I was like in my twenties, um, really formed the sort of basis, the sort of uh, locale basis from which all of the poems that are set in the Philippines uh, was really built. So. This is one of those, I'll, I'll read more of them, but this is one of them that I feel like connects sort of to what I was talking about last time. Um, I'll read two actually, um, in which the same friend appears twice because she was the one that I, I wound up having the most conversations with uh, because she was just a lot smarter than me. So um, I'll read two, both of which feature her and then, and then we'll move on from there. So this one is called The Result of an Overabundance of Scenery. Rain slaps the metal ceiling of this city as if it wanted inside, as if it weren't already inside. Over the last few Swedish bites of puto, my cousin tells me that for my next visit to the Philippines, he'll have destinations lined up, individual pearls linked on pale thread. I chew and think about more time in Baguio, the only place where it continue occasionally snows. I am trying to avoid phrasing things in terms of precipitation. The soothing cool, its quick and fervent lashings, how it wakes me up at night, exhaling into my ear, a single shell, some epitonium. The dogs in the streets ignore me, the flesh of a coconut or unbroken, its muffled sloshing. I fear I will develop a hunchback from stooping. I was buying oranges in the market, shuffling through my pesos, when my friend remarked that she had been wondering why all the vendors were speaking English to her, and then I'm like, wait, she said, and pointed at me. I asked the vendor the price in Tagalog, which is really all I can do, and pulled my hood up over my hair. You see, there is weather in every story. The wet breeze of it slides in through the window and smells of salt and charcoal. The winds let up. Roaming around the apartment, my feet are long and narrow, like my father's. I love my father. I love my mother. So what? Looking for a clean teacup, dabbing at a spot under the burner. Outside, a huge potted plant has fallen over. All right. And then I realize now that I'm reading them in this order, which I hadn't really planned on doing, that the two poems that have that one friend in it are actually remarkably similar. So I'm going to read that other one if I can find it. This is the problem with writing a sort of maximalist book is that you go to the table of contents and you're like, oh, that's actually not super helpful. I wrote a lot of poems and they're all in here. Why are they all in here? Why have I written so many? Um, so let me flip through here and try to find it. <laughs> oh, how embarrassing. How did I not mark this poem? I should have marked this poem. Oh, there it is. Great, cool. It's also about rain um, in that last poem. <laughs> the line sort of like, I'm tired of trying to avoid the rain, uh, that my introduction to the Philippines when I first got there was basically like, I was there for a week, I think. And then uh, we got hit by a typhoon. So I, we were fine. Um, it, as typhoons go, it wasn't that bad. And, um, but it meant that like, you were immediately confronted with like the most rain, like you'd ever seen. And so everything over the next like couple of weeks was just like, everything was phrased in terms of precipitation. Like there was just, it just rain everywhere. Um, and so this is about that um, on a kind of superficial way. But still like, you know, like what happens when you kind of get stuck inside, um, you think about these sorts of things. So this is called Other Deluges. And again, features my friend Teresa. 
There are, of course, times in the tropics when you think it couldn't come down any harder and there's threat in that. Drowning or cracking or the sick wash and thud of one followed by the other. There exists also a solution into which this precipitates, though I am not a chemist, which is obvious. I have lost my book of folk tales containing the myth of the Lansonis fruit, the woman pinching away its poison for her child. The ants in the kitchen have forced me to store all of my cereal in the refrigerator. The rain continues. And roofs become radios, the gray noise sweeping every broom made of, a hair, made of hair and difference. The startle, then the soothe. All cleaning is simply moving something from one place to another. The friend with whom I share my bedroom has done much more work with post-colonial theory than I have. And she says, I think it's important that the Fili Filipino American community recognizes the insidious effects of decades of hard assimilationism. And I think, yes, it's a real bear explaining to my mother why I am here. My mother says, why would you want to do that? Pushing everything downstream, the days pat the place down for contraband, leaving Manila's streets warmly slick with the grit of passing through in every direction. In stories, people move forward, pushing into their own spaces as happenings or points. Hands are the hardest part of the anatomy to draw because they could look like so many other things, none of them human. Hands are the reason why I do not draw, and this typhoon is the reason I am inside, placing my forehead gently upon a tall stack of paper. Apps for the sleepless use a kind of singly noted static, or sometimes a train, which I find baffling because who could possibly fall asleep knowing that a train was coming? I thought the point was to choose from amongst sounds that above all else would not be transient. I thought, that all I had to give was a distant ache, like that in the joints before the rain. Okay, move back across the Pacific now. It's enough time in the Philippines, time to come to Pennsylvania. So my father is um, from central Pennsylvania, so the kind of very tip of the Appalachian region. Um, and one of the sort of projects I have on my on the back burner now is I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which was a steel town, probably heard of Bethlehem Steel. Um, you know, either end of Pennsylvania is flanked by steel towns. You have Bethlehem Steel on one end and then all the sort of Pittsburgh steel mills on the other, but he's from right in the middle. Um, and so I always kind of call it where the sort of like the rust, the rust belt and like the coal belt kind of come together. Um, and his father, who died when I was a teenager, um, was a uh, sort of house call physician back when that was a thing you could do. But he was also a, he was also an avid hunter. Um, and as an extension of his avid hunting, he was actually a gunsmith. He made his own guns, like from the whole thing, like from the stock, the wood of the stock to the lathe um, that made the, the, the barrels. Um, he didn't make the bullets, obviously, but he filled his own bullets. And so uh, this is about that. My, the house my dad grew up in had sort of in a grand American series of ironies. Uh, the house he grew up in, the front part of it was devoted to my grandfather's um, sort of medical practice that people would come to his house, he would go to people's houses, but he had like an office there that was like, you know, full of medical stuff. And in the basement, there was a, essentially what amounts to a very small scale weapons manufacturing, like shop. Um, and so this is, it's not about that, paradox, but I thought I would just give you that too, so that you could have kind of that image in your mind. Um, but this is the first poem in the book, and it's called Still Life with Metalworking Shop. Central Pennsylvania, circa 1960, ink on paper. Oh, and I should, I should mention actually that this poem is in the form of, you know, when you go to an art museum and there are those little plaques next to paintings and stuff that tell you like, you know, who made it and when it was made. And then they, you know, somebody's written something about it. This takes the form of that, right? So think about it that way. So as if you're looking at a, as a, at a photograph or a painting, ink on paper. In this scene, we can see that the catalog of the gone records itself among the catalog of what remains. The objects resting in partial shadow upon the higher shelves, a single heat proof glove, 14 nails in a box marked Pepti-Cola, 
fluid in a jar. Most readily draw the eye, creating a sense of mystery, but also directing the gaze eventually downward, as if through layers of soil. Particularly evocative in this instance, not often found in the still life, artists preferring the fruits of the hunt, or as is well known, literal fruit, are the boxes and boxes of relatively small caliber bullets slotted into a custom-built storage unit, indicating that this shop was used almost exclusively for the fashioning of rifles. Suggestive of the card catalogs that once lined library walls, the array of ammunition invites the viewer to think about the organizational qualities of violence. An oiled rag indicates attention to detail. Questions for art educators. How does this scene juxtapose nostalgia and the domination of man over nature? What physical sensations are evoked by the hard lines of the anvil in the lower right-hand side of the frame? How do those sensations contrast with those produced by the empty, wheeled wooden chair, center, off left, rolled slightly away from a desk upon which rest yet more bullets, some graph paper, writing utensils, and other things now lost to the mind trying to retrieve this picture for the viewer? How do you think the owner of this chair might react if his son married someone who was not white? If you or a family member has ever aimed a gun at an animal, perhaps the array of tools scattered about the scene will hold a special meaning. You can write these down on paper and they will become a bouquet of pheasants, flushed and fleeing. Okay, so... I think... I will read, um, because she mentioned it, I wasn't planning to, uh, but because Professor Dow mentioned it, I will read the Minot, because this is one of those poems. So for those of you uh, that were in class earlier today, I spent a bunch of time talking about how like, I wrote this book once and then I kind of like wrote, wrote it again, but I did give some indications that there were a couple of poems in this um, collection that hadn't really actually changed much. And this is one of them, actually. So, so Hannah, your, your favorite poem is, is an oldie. Um, but so this, this is one that uh, I wrote and changed the form a little bit, but the story basically remained the same. And it is, it's one of those things that would be, it would have been nearly impossible to change because, you know, everybody has those sort of like childhood memories that like, even though you're not entirely sure if they're entirely accurate, they're like seared into your brain, right? Like you just remember, you know, like maybe the colors are off or maybe I wasn't even in that place, but like, and they often involve family members <clears throat> and uh, you just carry them with you for years and years. And so this is, this is one of those, right? And I had to get it out and I don't think any number of revisions, there's no way to abstract it from the narrative that is just stuck somewhere in like the, my spinal cord, right, effectively. So this is called The Minnow and it has an epigraph from Lee Young Lee, um, sort of wonderful poet. If you don't know him, please, please get to know him. So Lee Young Lee's um, line, as we eat, as we eat, we are eaten. Permanence in its incarnation presiding over the sink. The aproned comma of my Lola cleaning squid. Deftly her hands moved between the knife and tentacle cradled the clouded mantles. Once she called her granddaughter to work and I came. The smell of the sea, the presence of death, the preservative of salt laying its net upon my face. Perhaps I was nine. She proffered her palm, small and smooth as an absence, and into it I peered to see a squid, not yet eviscerated, split from head fin to siphon and laid open like a question, tentacles trailing from its body, gravity flattened. Inside, a minnow lay, whole almost to perfection, silver as the sea in sunlight and staring startled upward. What did she say then to her daughter's daughter, American child, my grandmother who has seen so much of the insides of so many things? I've forgotten. Perhaps it was nothing, silence bearing the weight that words those birds refuse. At any rate, I stood in some way, perhaps a gog, 
fish-like. And in that moment, I would not touch it, that nested predation. The imagined feel and leavings of it, mucus or a membrane, the gray odor ghosting beneath fingernails, staying my hand. In the intervening hours, what changes? The past slaps darkly against the coast of the immediate and surety of what we would or wouldn't do becomes a matter of taste, not of truth. Learning to love is not the same as being fed. Fingers cleaning, fingers moving food to mouth, both glisten. A small motion of the wrist and the minnow slipped down to the wet pile of squid innards, shining there like my thoughts on the subject, still and open-mouthed. She plucked out the ink sack, set it aside, plucked the next squid from the pile and continued her work, slicing, plucking, setting aside. That evening, I labeled, ladled adobo onto my plate, squid, ink, vinegar, peppercorns. What we understand of death may be only that it is a kind of labor, a further but obscured process. So I think while I'm on that super cheerful note about death, I'm gonna read another poem about Death. You know what? No, I'm not. That's enough death for one evening. I'm going to read a poem about communism. Um, this one is <laughs> based on a statue of Jesus um, that was in, no, was it probably, it, I'm sure it still is, in the sort of foyer of the, um, at the minor basilica of St. Lorenzo Ruiz, uh, which is in Bonondo, Manila. And so um, the Philippines, as you may know, is the only Catholic country in Southeast Asia, right? It's extremely Catholic. It was conquered by the, uh, colonized by the Spaniards um, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Before that, it was colonized by the Chinese. And so this, um, this Catholic church is in the middle of Manila's Chinatown. So you, you see those layers of colonization sort of stacking on top of one another in this one particular spot. And, um, but the, the Catholicism of, the Philippines is a kind of weirdly, I mean, it's guilt filled like all Catholicism, but it's also sort of like weirdly joyful. And in, in the way of sort of like um, Filipino sort of like celebratory culture. And so the, this statue of Jesus, which was huge, right? So it was like on this plinth, which is like, you know, right at kind of like eye level. You'll see this in the poem. There's this enormous statue of Jesus and somebody had dressed him in like what, what, for all practical intents and purposes looked like a prom gown. Like it was this sort of red, roughly sort of gown thing. Um, and he was in the way that he was carved, he was has, like was like standing really straight and had a cross over his shoulder. So he, and the, the, the gown that he was in had these sorts of like these ruffled sleeves and everything. Um, and it was just such a sort of wonderful, I mean, it was funny, obviously, but there was something more to it than that. Um, something more serious about the, the sort of potential, I think, of religion and, and what we could do with it. And so I wrote this poem, um, which I sort of irreverently titled um, Jesus in a Prom Gown. Um, but it's one of my favorite ones to read because it is one of the more optimistic ones in the book, which you know, is like obviously poetry books are not known for being like super cheerful, um, but I like this one because it is a little bit more upbeat. Jesus in a prom gown at the minor basilica of St. Lorenzo Ruiz in Bonondo, Manila. He died for our sins, but the revolution betrayed him. None of the right feet are washed anymore. None of the bankers tables overturned. But the sun continues to explode above our heads and the glitter that issues forth is sometimes real glitter. So here's Jesus standing pin straight in the antechamber with a cross slung over his shoulder as if it weighed no more than a staff of sugar cane. Outside the world's first Chinatown rings itself in scarlet and so does Jesus 
swathed in yards and yards of dime store fabric, red as luck and heavy with sequins. He's a pretty date, a white ruff encircling his neck, his sleeves belling out like trumpet fanfare. His hands and feet are bare. Surprise is useful for confessions. I did not know the proper ratio of wine to water. I realized later my tendency to see only misery. Forgive me. This place plinks itself along like a lilting Catholic telegraph, relaying light suffering in red rayon dot, 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 dash, dash, dot, dot, dot. Help us. Our idols are very much alive, but our enemies are also in power. Jesus faces the door and shimmers slightly in the heat. His toes, perched at about eye level on a block of granite, have been worn to gold from prayer. A heresy. This is how you ought to be the confident head of a vermilion drag parade. Recalibrate our expectations for how joyous it would be to give everyone, everywhere, loaves and loaves of bread. I am mindful of the time. So instead of moving to the chat book, um, I am going to read the title poem and then I'll stop and you can ask me any questions that you might like to ask. Um, might need you, uh, Hannah, to relay some questions. I don't think I'm gonna be able to hear somebody, but I, you've done this before, you know what you're doing. Um, so that was actually, that was, this is a good transition because uh, this, this the title poem, which is actually, it's not in the front of the, it's smack in the middle of the book, um, is also a little bit about what I want to be the sort of like undercurrent of the book, which is that despite, the loneliness and despite the sort of like really violent history of colonization um, and imperialism that sort of like underlies the very fact of like someone like me being like existing in the world, um, that there is always the opportunity to imagine something better and different. Um, and sometimes comes in the form of thinking self, um, thinking through oneself and, and, and trying to figure out um, in one's own self-consciousness where sort of like better politics lies. So this is the title poem, it's called A Brief History of Fruit. Um, and, then, and then I'll stop. These were the years in which I saw myself an apple blushing from red to yellow and back again. My father puts a box of clementines on the counter. As an oncologist, he does not grow things, but causes them to cease to grow. Recompense is a fancy way of saying that we believe in the finite quality of deeds. Sometimes I sit with a peach under my nose and allow it to change the air there, an indentation labeled peach. At some point, everyone's family had to deal with the question of sustenance. It's how they answer the question that leads to both agriculture and geopolitics. I love the multiple ways in which one can use the word cultivation. There are so many things to be coaxed out of wherever they're hiding. What does it mean anyway to live in a country? I wouldn't know. I go to the store and shop for the avocados that feel like they might ripen in a few days because I harbor a deep distrust of immediate satisfaction. I keep telling myself that naming everything I've eaten will convince various juries that I am not guilty. Raspberry, cherry, coconut, santol, passion fruit, dislike, apricot, luchy, mango, blueberry. So many different centers. Some that you can bite right through, some that you can drink, and some that will crack your teeth apart. Writing about seeds, means also to write about permission, which could be pretty, pretty revolutionary if you think about it. Thank you for being here with me. Oh, hearing actual, hearing actual clapping is a real boon, I think at this point in the pandemic, because you know, I've gotten a lot of the, uh, 
the, the hand clap, like zoom emoji, right? That's kind of where we're at right now. So actual noise is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. That was really wonderful. And thank you all for coming. Um, we do have some time for Q&A. And so Hunter is going to run around and um, with the microphone and kind of get some questions from the audience. And I'm going to monitor the chat. So if anybody watching from oh, yeah, please, uh, afar, or maybe not that far, but feeling far, if you have any, any questions, you can type those in and I will I will pass those along. So, yeah, please. Any questions? Oh. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Okay, hi, thank you for being here. Um, so I self-published a poetry book at the end of last year, so, I'm just curious, not only how do I like just help market that book and everything, but in the future um, to pursue like an actual publishing company or something like that. Um, what's your advice for poets that want to get published? Sure, absolutely. Um, it's it's a tough one. It's gonna it's a different road for everyone, right? If you self-publish, you know that the um, the the obvious sort of like the disadvantage of self publishing is that you you're your own company right like you got to do everything kind of yourself um, I mean the best way in 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 your case right the best way to get the word out about an existing book right is to it's this sort of horrible hustling work um, that involves like emailing every single person you've ever met in your entire life um, but also trying to get somebody, anybody, anywhere to sort of review it. Um, and you know, there might be journals that you really like. Um, online journals are great actually for this because it means that somebody can just Google your name and it'll come up. Um, but, you know, sending copies to people to review the book um, can really help get eyes on it. That is, that is one thing that I think that um, I would say unequivocally. In terms of getting another book out there, the economy of poetry publishing, as we all know, um, is a racket <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it, so this, this book, right, happened to, and I say happened to because it is, it is luck, right, uh, win the Akron Poetry Prize in 2018. So it got plucked out of a pile of about 600 other books that got submitted to that prize that year. And that's why it got published in the way that it did. Um, that is one of the ways that you can, you can get a book out there. Um, what I had to do in order to do that was to submit this manuscript um, to, I don't even know how many contests I submitted to. It was many, many, many contests. Luckily, I, I won this award sort of in the middle of that. So I pulled it away, I pulled it out of a bunch of other contests. But like I got, this book has been rejected from, any number of presses before Akron picked it up. Um, and thank goodness that they did. Mary Bittinger, the, the editor there has been a sort of a dream to work with. Um, but that is one way to, to and, and a lot of people think it's kind of the only way to get your sort of debut book. Um, if, you, if you're going for a press or a non-self-published new debut book out there. There are other ways to do things. Um, you know, there are, Smaller presses um, will publish micro chaps and chat books and like little pamphlets and things like that. So you can have kind of an art object. That is one way to think about um, maybe getting a smaller collection out there. And a lot of those, it's not nearly as daunting. You don't have to think about like, oh my God, there's 600 other books here um, to, you know, like I, someone up in, um, uh, up in Ottawa actually publishes uh, this thing that she, she runs this press called Post Ghost Press kind of out of her apartment. She puts together these tiny little like pamphlets full of poetry. And I just think they're the most beautiful things in the whole world. You can buy like 4 million of them for like $15. And then you have these like um, little sort of like wonderful little art bits to like sort of give to people or keep for yourself or whatever. And that's one way of getting like little collections out there. The whole big collection though, right? Something that's like a hundred pages or, you know, 75 pages or something like that. That requires entering into an economy that, that is quite difficult. And so what I would say, all this is a way to say, coming back around, is to, you know, if you're thinking about writing another book, um, do it, first of all. But also make sure that you're keeping um, that 
you are keeping yourself sort of realistic by, you know, running it by trusted writers that you know, professors, um, people that you, people, you know, other professional writers that you have contacts with. Um, people that have published before can read it and tell you kind of like where it's at. Um, and then also if individual poems from a given book manuscript are getting published in decent journals, right? That's a good sign. So you can always take the temperature of a manuscript by thinking like, are people picking up the poems from this? Are, are they getting published in places um, that are of interest to me? And if, that, if that's the case, then, you know, um, that's a sign. And, and you can kind of move forward from there. So do I have like a magic bullet? No, but like, you know, I can tell you about my process and I can tell you like, you know, the kinds of things that I, I, I try to tell my students. So I hope that gives you a little bit more info. Like obviously, like if you have more questions about that sort of like professional end of things, um, you know, you can feel free to, to contact me. I'm more than happy to, to answer any more questions about that. Um, so I hope that-, that um, Yeah, thank you. No, that's very helpful. That's a lot of things that I wouldn't have thought of. So I appreciate that. Great. You're welcome. Thanks, Maya, in the chat, um, because she said she liked Jesus in a prom gown, and so I'm very pleased about that. It's one of that. Speaking of professional publication stuff, that poem, nobody wanted that poem. Nobody wanted to publish that poem, and it is universally when I give readings, somebody's always like, "I liked the Jesus in a prom gown." poem. So like everything that I said, it doesn't apply universally because everybody is fickle. So who knows, right? Um, so I'm so glad that I'm so glad that you like it because like no lit mags did. I don't know. Who else wants to ask me something? Hi, it's Chase again from Dr. Oh, yeah. Dow's class. I thought I recognized your sweatshirt. Oh, yeah. It's my work hoodie. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to press uh, preface this question with a little bit of an explanation because it's a little bit of an odd one. But um, in our poetry class with Dr. Dow, we do workshops all the time to obviously help us develop our poetry skills. And as part of the workshops, we'll, you know, read the poem and go around and have everyone speak and give kind of their interpretation of it and what they liked and about it, what they thought you could improve. And sometimes specifically with my poems, I uh, got some rather unusual interpretations at times or, or people taking things in a different way than I had meant them, which is fine because you know that's one of the great things about poetry. But my question to you is what is the most unusual or interesting interpretation of one of your poems someone has given you? Oh, what a phenomenal question. And I really wish I had an answer for it. <sighs> there is, you know, nobody has been bonkers about it. I really, you know, I wish I had a good answer to that question because it means that somebody would have read my poetry in a way that I was like, what about? Um, but nobody has, like, which, mean, which must mean that my poetry is too straightforward. Thank you, Chase, for alerting me to a problem here, is that, like, my poetry is not weird enough. There's not enough room for me, for somebody to just, like, come up with, like, a sort of, like, totally off-the-wall interpretation of my poetry. Um, I think that one of the things about having published um, a full-length book is that you do see people interpreting your work kind of in front of you, um, which is real weird, like, it's bizarre. But it's also people are generous and they are, um, they're generous and they're insightful and they do pick out things that you hoped people would pick out. I think that um, one of the most interesting experiences I had was actually reading Diane Seuss's prize citation because I had not thought much, I think about the overarching, and we talked about this a little bit in class actually, I had not taught, thought a, a ton about the overarching emotional arc of the book. I thought a lot about the sort of ideas like where the poem is or like what I wanted to say in it or the sort of like um, what part of my family this is about. I thought about all of those things when I was arranging the collection like we talked about in class, but I hadn't really thought about like what the overall impact emotionally of the collection would be. And Diane Seuss's uh, Prize Citation had in it the sort of like, this is a book that is about existential loneliness. And I was like, is I that lonely? 
And I was like writing this book and I guess I was like, oh God, I guess I was in any number of ways, right? Because I, I did sort of write the book in a vacuum. I didn't have any other sort of like half Asian people to talk about it with. I didn't really have any Asian people to talk about it with uh, because my MFA program was largely white folks. Um, and so I was like, oh God, she like, definitely intuited something or like read something about the whole collection or about the sort of whole emotional tenor of the whole collection that I hadn't really thought about, but I was clearly like just coming into over and over and over again was this sort of this sense of dislocation. But, but did I think to myself, I'm writing a book that's about dislocation? No, I never really did. I was like, I'm writing a book that's about two places as opposed to no place. But she gave me the language to think, to think and talk the way that I introduced the book, the way that I think about the book now um, has to do with her, like that citation being like the, the, this, um, you know, the overall emotional tenor of this book is existential loneliness and Andrews owns it. And I was like, do I own it? I guess, I guess I do now. <laughs> so that was, it was not off the wall, but surprising and very helpful is, is the uh, injustice. I'm going to have to do your question there, but that's a fantastic question. It's one of the best questions I think I've ever gotten in a reading. So well done. It tickles someone like me to talk to. Yeah, thank you. I have maybe a question. I don't know if you can see me. I can't, but like I can hear the back you. of me. You can hear me, okay. Um, yeah. So, in you're also a scholar, and I know we have some people here who are maybe literary studies majors, either here or zooming in. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the perhaps symbiotic relationship between your scholarship and your creative work. I know you you talked a lot about the way that your scholarship and the kind of training and thinking that you do to do your critical work informs your poetry. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that or the way that maybe your, if your creative work informs your scholarship as well. Yeah, it's mostly the first way and not the second way. I think my, well, no, I should not say that. What am I talking about? My scholarship is deeply influenced by my poetry, uh, but not, not the poetry. My scholarship is deeply influenced by the fact of being a poet, right? I mean, so my, my first scholarly book, um, which is hopefully if I can ever get it revised, will come out next year at some point, so sometime in 2022, is quite literally about like what it means to be an academic poet, like what it means to be a poet that wants to work in sort of experimental forms within the confines of the confines of the university. Um, and it's basically an auto, it's an autobiographical book insofar as like that was my position and I wanted to explore it. I am not in the book. I examine authors from like John Ashbery to Joy Graham, um, you know, Claudia Rankin, Nate, Nate Mackey, um, and like what it is like for them to navigate poetry with this sort of like scholarly bent to it. Um, so that was very much like me thinking about my own positionality and then like wanting to do scholarship about it. So in that way, poetry has absolutely influenced my scholarship. I'm also a, a poetry scholar, right? So like just poetry is what I do all the time. Like I don't ever ask me to write a short story. I cannot create characters for the life of me. I love reading really good characters, mostly because I don't know why anybody does it. I really don't. I have not a single plot bone in my body. Um, so it influences it that way, right? I just don't really have any interest in criticizing fiction. Movies though, I do do film criticism. Um, so there is that, I don't know what the deal is there. Um, in terms of my scholarship influence in my poetry, um, it does a little bit here. Like I, you know, again, I talked to your workshop about the way in which I revised the book on the other side of a PhD, um, and and really tried to infuse a lot of my poems with a kind of more explicit sense of argument. That's happening, unfortunately, maybe even more now in my sort of second and third projects, where um, the line is breaking down ever more frequently, and so I'm winding up with these sort of like prose chunks. Because what I'm finding is that I, my scholarly brain says, make an argument. My poetry brain says, like, make a bunch of images. And I find that when I combine them, what I wind up is, is what I wind up with, there we go, is a sort of strange, like, critical, poetic hybrid where, like, I'm definitely trying to make a point, but I am doing it, um, I'm doing it in a way that is juxtaposed always with um, kind of poetic observation. 
And I'm really enjoying working in that mode. I don't know if anybody else is going to enjoy me working in that mode, but I, I like it um, because it gives me the freedom. In, in some ways it allows me to do scholarship without um, the really, I think useful, but very, very, very difficult task of like putting together a kind of airtight argument. You don't have to put it together an airtight argument when you're writing a book of poems, like no one cares. Um, and so that gives you some freedom to like assert things without having to like back them up by like going in, you know, by being a historian or whatever. Um, so that's useful. And, but I also, I also like it um, because it allows the poetry to have a point in a way that um, is more satisfying to me, I think, than what I'd been doing sort of in the past. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't think of those the, the, though in the way that I have described it, my poetry deeply influences my scholarship, my scholarship deeply influences my, my poetry, I cannot write them at the same time. I'm either writing criticism, which is what I'm doing right now, I'm not writing book of poems, or I'm writing poems, which is like what I was doing like a year ago and I wrote a book of poems. Um, I, I can't do them at the same time. And I don't actually really think about myself as being a kind of, I like, I either have my poet brain on or I have my like critic brain on when I'm, when I'm writing. And whenever I'm speaking, I'm speaking as a, as a critic, essentially. Um, the way that I answer questions in a Q&A like this, I, I try to think like a critic and not, I'm not like a poet. Um, that's probably an, an unpopular answer, but I really, I do feel like those two facets of my identity are actually quite separate in that way. That's great. Thank you. And I realized that might have sounded like a job interview question. So I apologize for that, but I really enjoyed your answer. Um, and I think probably a lot of others did too. So great. Any thank you other... so much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I, as, as uh, Kim said, there are books for sale. Um, they are kind of up there at that table there. They are signed and slightly discounted. Um, so for those of you who would like to buy a book, um, I have that information up there. And for those of you who are maybe still hanging out on Zoom, um, if it's okay with you, Kim, I'll hold on to the books for a couple more days. So if people want to stop by um, the yeah. English department and, and buy a book, um, you don't have to do it today. We'll have it for maybe a couple more days. Please take them off my hands. I do not want them. <laughs> <laughs> you harder. All right. Well, thank you once again. Thank you all for being here. Maybe yeah. one more round of applause to our visiting writer. Thanks for coming.